Um, but we know that the Lord can heal. Um, I want to personally introduce to you this morning um, a, a gentleman who, by the way, was ready to come and speak this morning regardless of pastor not being here or not. So God kind of orchestrated things ahead of time, and he always looks out for us. But um, we, I have had the pleasure of having uh, the temples with us this weekend. Um, Jay Temple is going to come and speak to you this morning. His wife, Cece, uh, their lovely children, Amelia and um, Jimmy have been with us. Jimmy consequently spoke with the youth on Friday night, and he en empowered them and impacted them to do great things for um, God in 2015. And I know that Jay will do that as well. Um, Pastor's known Jay for about 20 years or more. Uh, they've been real friends, um, close um, together, worked in ministry, done some things together. Um, currently, Jay serves with the um, <clears throat> a Native missions group that um, impacts um, all around the world. And um, he's going to come and share a few things with us this morning about how we can impact our world. So will you give your um, attention to Brother Jay? Thank you very much. It's a joy to be here with you this morning. I was uh, glad when Pastor invited me to come. We were, actually, I was down here last weekend doing some ministry nearby, and we met up with the McCartys for dinner on Saturday, and just in the course of walking around the mall together and enjoying fellowship, just sharing some things, what the Lord was doing here in Carrollton, some of the things the Lord's been doing in our lives. Uh, the pastor invited me to come, and I guess it did work out well, although I know you're missing him, and I wish he was here and not sick, because though we've been blessed to be in their home and enjoy the wonderful hospitality of the McCarty family, not had a whole lot of fellowship with him because he's been so sick. So a lot of what I'm going to share are things that we talked about last weekend um, as we were, were sharing uh, really just how wonderful God is and, and how much He loves people and how when we go out and love people, the greatest love we can demonstrate is in declaring and sharing the gospel. Uh, we do serve as missionaries. Uh, we're ordained in the church of God, but we work with a group called Advancing Native Missions. Um, I didn't come here to share about that. I wouldn't have time right now anyway, but there is a table out there. Please help yourself to a magazine or some newsletters. And if you'd like to know more, there's a place you can uh, just leave your address and we'll put you on a mailing list. We won't pester you, we won't bother you, won't overload you with stuff, but we would be glad uh, to share what God's doing and have you be a part of it through your prayers. We'll read from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> the scripture says, actually I think we'll read to verse 9. Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 9. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk up rightly. He keeps the paths of judgment and preserves the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yeah, every good path. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll anoint this message today and bring it to life that you'll challenge your people, that you'll correct, Lord, and convict where necessary. But, Lord, that most of all, this will be just an encouragement, that this will be rich encouragement from you to people who love you and who are called according to your purposes. Lord, please keep me from being a hindrance to what you'd like to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you looked at... I guess it was the back of the bulletin, there was a word about evangelism, and that's the topic this morning. So we were walking through the mall last weekend, we were taking opportunities to, to talk to people, to, to share 
the gospel with them when we could, to be a witness when we couldn't, and, and there is a distinction between the two. Uh, we passed out some tracts, and the pastor said, just come and just share from your heart today some of the things that, that we've talked about. You see, this word evangelism can be defined this way. Evangelism is the spreading of the gospel by public preaching and by personal witness. Now, we know not everyone is called to preach in a formal vocational setting. That's the job of pastors and evangelists and missionaries, those who are called by God specifically for a position that gives a platform for public preaching. But every one of us is called to declare the gospel through personal witness. Now, when we think about evangelism, sometimes we get mixed up. And that's why I say there's a difference between evangelizing and witnessing. Evangelism is not inviting someone to church. We should do that. We trust that when they come to church, and I'm confident when they come to Healing Waters, they will be evangelized, they will hear the gospel, because your pastor is a man faithful to the preaching of the gospel. But inviting someone to church is not evangelizing. It's not sharing our personal testimony. That's being a witness, but our testimony is not a means to salvation. It can set the stage, it can make an interest. Evangelism is not charitable work. It's not political action or the pursuit of social justice. We as Christians are called to be involved in these things, but that's not evangelism. Evangelism is not apologetics or the defending of our faith. Evangelism is not church planting, although that gives a platform for evangelism. You see, evangelism is when a believer in Christ, when a follower of Christ, when a Christian, shares the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the Gospel, with a person who has yet to believe. So what then is the gospel? Now, uh, listen, listen with an open heart. Because I, I grew up in a context where it wasn't always clearly presented what the gospel is. The gospel is not that God loves you and wants you to have a better life. The gospel is not that God has a wonderful plan for your life. The gospel is not, give Jesus a try and see how good He is. The gospel is not that you have a God-shaped hole in your heart that only Jesus can fill. Let me illustrate it this way, because I, I've heard the evangelism take place in this kind of a context. Now let me say, I believe all of these things are true. I believe that God does indeed have a wonderful life for people, but how He defines wonderful and how we define it is sometimes different. I believe that man is looking for something to worship, and God is the one, the only one, who is worthy of worship. Okay? But this is not the Gospel. Troy, if you wouldn't mind, help me out. You can just stay seated there. Imagine we're on an airplane, and then kind of on those rows and feeling packed in, and the flight attendant comes up and says, Sir, I've got this for you. This is a parachute. Please put that on. This is going to make your ride better. It's going to make your seat more comfortable. It's going to make your food taste better. It's going to make you enjoy the in-flight movie more. You are going to love this flight if you keep that parachute on. Now, I heard some of you giggling already. The longer he sits here, the more he's gonna, we're going to giggle, especially if he's the only one wearing the parachute. And the longer he sits there, the heavier that thing's going to get, the more uncomfortable it's going to get. It's not going to make his food taste any better. That's a matter of the taste buds, not what we're carrying on our back. It's not going to make his flight movie any more comfortable or, or more enjoyable. That has nothing to do with what he's wearing. And eventually, he's going to start to get uncomfortable. And when he sees no one else is wearing the parachute, and it really hasn't changed anything, in fact, it's made things a little bit worse than they were, what's he going to do? 
He's going to want to take it off. And when I come back with a pot of hot coffee and accidentally spill it in his lap, he's going to curse me, take that thing off, and be done with it because he's going to think I lied. Thank you, brother. Appreciate the help. Now let's think about it this way. Flight attendant, and I come back, sir, got a parachute for you, and I want you to put it on. See, we've got a problem. Both of the engines have collapsed. They failed. The pilot, in his anguish over this, has had a heart attack. In trying to help the pilot, the, the co-pilot suffered a stroke. We're over the Atlantic. We're, 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 we're losing fuel. There is nothing we can do. This flight is going down. Please put this parachute on because at some point, we don't know exactly when, but we're going to have to jump and this is the only thing that will save you. What's he going to do? He's going to put it on. He's going to keep it on. He may still eat his meal. May not enjoy it as much as he would have. He may watch his movie and not really think about what he's watching because his mind's on one thing. The, sh the, the plane's going down and there's nothing we can do about it. And when I come by with that pot of hot coffee and I accidentally spill it all over him and he's feeling it burning him, he's going to look forward to the jump. See, that's what the gospel is all about. It's not about how we feel because... Let me tell you something, if you've been serving the Lord for any length of time, you already know it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. There's a whole dimension of problems and suffering and trials that come for no other reason than we are following God. So to come along and say God has a wonderful plan for your life, put on Jesus, everything's going to be better, is not true out of context. Because sometimes putting on Jesus makes things worse from an earthly perspective. But from an eternal perspective, we have a parachute on, and when the plane goes down, we're ready to jump. You see, the gospel is God's remedy for sin. The good news that we have forgiveness of sin through Jesus' death, through His burial, through His resurrection, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And the Gospel is indeed good news. But good news never seems good without the bad. We all hear it. You want the good news or the bad news first? Well, give me the bad news first. Why? Because we want something to end with on a positive note, and we know good news may not be good until we've heard what the bad is. And you see, the bad news is that all of us are under the wrath of God. Have you ever told a lie? What do we call a person that tells lies? Liar. Have you ever stolen anything? What do you call someone who steals? Thief? A stealer? A thief? Okay. If you ever committed adultery, wouldn't, wouldn't dream of it. I love my wife too much. Jesus said, if you've so much as looked at another person with a lustful thought, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You ever murdered? No, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't want to hurt a person that way. Well... Jesus said, Scripture says, if you've hated your brother, you've already murdered him in your heart. You see, God doesn't judge just actions, but he monitors and judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. You ever used his name lightly, an expletive, a curse word, just for fun, oh my OMG, I think's the way you do it on the cell phones now. You're a blasphemer. A sin so serious it warranted the death penalty. And still does. Because Scripture says that the wages of sin is death. One lie. One paperclip taken from an employer. 
one OMG texted to a friend. And that's not all ten of the commandments. And if we examine them this morning in spirit, if not in deed, we would find we have violated every one. And God, who is a just judge, a good judge, will one day judge us according to our actions. And He's already made the pronouncement that death is warranted. Romans 6, 23. So we need to be saved. And when we think of salvation, we think, well, God saves us from our sins. Well, He does break the curse and the bondage and the penalty for our sins. But when we're saved, we're being saved from God Himself. We're being saved from His just wrath because we're sinners. And you see, the Scripture tells us in 1 Timothy, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So what saves us? Good things, going to church, paying tithes, giving offering, helping the poor, turning over a new leaf, will not save. While every eye is closed and every head bowed, coming to the altar will not save. Repeating the words of a sinner's prayer will not save. I knew a guy I grew up with at church in Culpeper, Virginia. Every revival, he came forward, repeated words, and walked away just as, as sinful and ugly as he came in because he felt a pressure to respond. But there was no repentance. There was no faith in God. Words will not save. Being dipped into the waters of baptism, writing your name on the rolls of church membership will not save. We need to be saved this morning. And there's a world that needs to be saved. And that's why God sent His Son to take our punishment. Because a holy, just, righteous, good God cannot leave sin unanswered. He cannot overlook a lie. He cannot overlook a theft. And He sent His Son to take our punishment, to pay our fine, to suffer the death sentence we were under on our behalf so that we can be justified. And that's a theological term. It's actually a legal term. term. It means that we can be declared legally righteous. Not just not guilty, but completely innocent, and it's a gift of grace, Romans 3.24, by faith, Romans 3.28, because Jesus Himself, the perfect, sinless, unblemished Lamb of God, the Son of God, God the Son, bore our guilt and took our penalty. So what do we do? Confess that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Repent. Turn from your sin. Make a conscious decision to move away from sin. Will we still sin? We know we do. Because we're still in flesh. We're still in a wicked world. But there's a difference. We don't dive into sin. We don't run towards it. We don't love it. No, we hate it. We grieve when we slip. Turn from your sins. Forsake your sin. John the Baptist preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. In fact, Jesus said without repentance, they would perish. Proverbs 28, He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Peter said repent and be converted that your sins be blotted out. You know what brings joy to heaven? Not when a new baby's born. Not when a believer is healed. Not when somebody gets a new car or a promotion at work. I believe God delights in these things because every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. No, what Scripture says brings joy to heaven is when a sinner repents. Because if there's no repentance, there's no joy because there's no salvation. And then we believe, we put our trust, we put our faith in Jesus Christ and the work done on the cross 
Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Salvation comes, according to 2 Timothy 3, 15, by faith in Christ Jesus. And the point this morning is, we have been glorious saved if we have confessed our sins, repented of them, and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And we should be rejoicing, and that rejoicing should drive us to make a difference in a world that's still waiting. You see, good news is not good news if it doesn't get there in time. And it may not get there in time unless we deliver it. What are some of the barriers? Fear of man makes it hard to go out and witness. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be felt weird. We don't want somebody to react in anger. We don't want to be asked a question. Maybe we're not prepared to answer. But, but, but the Lord said the fear of man is a snare. But he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Isaiah puts it this way, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of a man who dies? You see, we're afraid, and, and part of that is because we really don't know where to start. So I'm going to give you just a simple model as we're going to be moving into to another part of the service uh, of how to start. Do like Jesus did. Begin with something natural. I was in front of the dentist's office sitting in a, in a waiting bench. A fellow sat down next to me, the usual small talk. Hey, you know, how you doing? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Deerfield, Virginia, he said. Really? That was where that... that Jet, that military plane from Massachusetts crashed just about a week ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Man, can you imagine that? Just like that. Pilot loses life. Have you ever thought about what's next? We started with something natural. Uh, uh, something that happened in the news. And right there we made a switch to something spiritual. What's next? He said, well, yeah, I think about it all the time. I'm not sure what's next. And it led into a conversation. And we talked about, well, there's, there's heaven, and there's a hell. You know, well, if, if you were standing before the Lord, and, and He were to look at you, uh, what do you think? Are you a good person? Oh, yeah, I, I try to be. You ever told a lie? Well, yeah. What's it make you? He said, well, it makes me a human. <laughs> and it does. I said, no, if, if, I, if I lied to you, what would you call me? A liar? Thief? We, we went through the law. Because you see, the Scripture says that the law is a schoolmaster that brings us to the knowledge of God. The, the, the Scripture says that it's the law that reveals sin to us. And we went through the commandments. And he couldn't say he was a good person anymore. Well, if you stood before God, what, what would he find you? Innocent or guilty? He said, guilty. I've got some good news for you. And I shared with him about the work of Jesus Christ. You see, we, we make witnessing into something that it's not meant to be. We, first of all, we confuse witnessing and evangelism, and we never get to the gospel. But it's only the gospel that will save. Now, I'm just going to show you a few quick things that can be used as, as icebreakers, because I know it's hard. It's hard to get started. You're standing in line, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, getting ready to pay for your meal. You ask the, the, the gal working the cash register, have you got change for a big bill? Yeah, everybody enjoyed that. I hope you'll take a look at it. Chris will show it to you later. It's got the gospel on the back. Or you walk up to somebody in the mall, did you get one of these yet? Now you see what he did. Naturally, he put his hand out. Some people say, well, what is it? Well, it's uh, just a commemorative coin. Got the Ten Commandments on it. Got the gospel on the other side. Enjoy it. Have fun. You go up to somebody in the mall. You've got two cards. Which one of these looks longest? You sure? It's positive. Which one looks longest? Okay, it's an optical illusion. Nobody turns these down because they're thinking, man, I can't wait to show that to my friend. Make sure and read the back. It's a gospel track. You see, there are all kinds of different ways to, to open the door 
to sharing the gospel and moving from something natural, a, a little aluminum coin, a piece of paper that, that's a funny kind of uh, joke, and there are other things here. We'll give you some on the way out. My son's going to be at the back door. There's billion, million dollar bills. There's wallets that you lay on the floor because it looks real and you open it. And the question is, if this was a real wallet, what would you do? Would you keep it? Would you turn it in? It starts to convict the conscience. And you see, when you move from the natural to the spiritual, people are open. And maybe sometime we'll be able to come back and share some more in terms of the pragmatics of how to do this. But I want to close with this. You see, we don't do this because we're afraid. But yet, Scripture tells us that the fear of man is a snare. We don't do this because we don't know where to start. Well, just start somewhere. What do you do for a living? And, and it doesn't matter. You can somehow turn it to truth. Sometimes we don't go out because we're not convinced that the gospel really works. But you see, the gospel is still the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I think a lot of times why we don't go out, and I want to say this gently, because we're not in right relationship with God ourselves. Like for the ushers as they're preparing for communion just to, to come and be ready. You see, Scripture says in Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, and prove yourselves. You see, the problem is we tend to get things backwards. Now, when it comes to our career, we're identified by what we do. Before I became a minister, I was a telephone man. I was a cable splicer. I was a cable splicer because I splice cable every day of my life, 10 years. But when it comes to a Christian, we're not what we are based on what we do. Okay? Telling the truth doesn't make me a Christian. Going out and handing out a track doesn't make me a Christian. Coming to church every Sunday faithfully, reading the Word of God every day does not make me a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm converted. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, I tell the truth. And I come to church. And I go out. And I hand out tracts. And I share the gospel with people. Scripture says... The Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And I invite you to, to come as you would normally uh, be served. When He had given thanks, He broke it. And He said, take ye. And we're going to do this together in just a minute. So as you get the elements, please hold them. He said, take eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Why? So that the wrath of God can be satisfied on your behalf. This do in remembrance of me. Then after the same manner, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. You know why it was shed for you? that your sins might be made white as snow, moved as far as the east is from the west, covered, blotted out, so that God, the great, the wise, the holy, the righteous judge could make a pronouncement, not just of not guilty, but of absolutely, completely innocent. So as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me.
For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He comes. Now here's the part I want you to challenge, challenge yourself with. Not as a matter of worry, not as a matter of concern. It was a matter of obedience to Scripture, practicality. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. You come to church to be a Christian. You try to keep moral standards to be a Christian. It won't work. But if you've truly been born again, have recognized, yeah, I'm a liar, a thief, an adulterer, a murderer, God, please save me. Lord, I confess these things. And I put my confidence in Your body that was broken. In Your blood that was shed so that God's justice would not be served on me. And I thank You, God, for sending Your Son to pay the penalty on my behalf. Lord, I, I renounce my sins. Help me to walk in truth and righteousness. And Lord, though I know I will stumble, keep me on the path following You. That's what we're remembering and celebrating this morning. The work that has made us free from the wrath of God and thus free from the bondage of our sins, free from the penalty of our sins. And now as we take this bread together, let's remember that it was broken for us and for a world that's still waiting to hear the Gospel. As we take the cup, we're remembering that we've been made clean by the word that was spoken to us and by the blood that was shed for us. And there's a world that doesn't know this yet, and they won't know until we tell them. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. Lord, thank You for the times You've healed us, the times You've provided, the times You've blessed. But those are temporary things, Lord. Thank You for what is eternal. The gift of salvation. And in the name of Jesus, bless this Your people, that they, when they leave here today, will go out with a reminder, not of what they do, but of who they are, who You've made them to be. And let that be reflected in the things that are said, in the things that are done. And may Your name be glorified in the blessed and precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord this morning. If you want a track, a sample to take with you, my son will be at the door and he'll be glad to give you one. And Read it. Be encouraged by the Gospel for yourself and then give it to somebody. God bless you. Oh.